morning and hopefully everyone is doing well today. Uh, today we're going to uh, get back to our studies in the New Testament and I thought that we would just open class with prayer. We're in our same room with uh, all of our maps and charts and things and so uh, we'll be using some of that stuff as we go along. Uh, hopefully everybody is doing well and I think there's um, the ability on Facebook to ask questions as we go along and I'm going to be on as well so we'll see how that works with being able to answer some of those things so feel free to uh, ask as uh, we go along but uh, let us open in prayer and then we'll get into the word. Dear Father we just thank you for this day and we just pray Lord that you would open our hearts to receive your message today just grant us wisdom to be able to understand your word and apply it to our lives we just pray, Lord, for uh, the nation and for uh, friends and family and uh, everyone just for their safety. We just pray uh, for health and for those that are affected by the virus to uh, just have a quick recovery. Uh, we just pray that you would grant us strength, take, uh, take uh, all of our cares and concerns and just know, Lord, that uh, you are in control of everything. And uh, just be with us today and, and help us be, uh, be witnesses uh, for you as we go about in our communities. We pray these things we love in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, so what we're going to do is uh, it's been a couple of weeks since uh, I've been in class. And uh, we have just, remember, finished up uh, with Old Testament uh, with the Gospel Project and getting started <clears throat> with the New Testament. So... I thought we would go ahead and just have a quick review again of where we've been and uh, set the stage. And it's important too, as we look at uh, the life of Jesus, we're looking today at uh, his dedication to understand what was going in, on in the world at the time, uh, how people were reacting to things. And it's gonna be particularly important as we look at uh, Simeon and Anna today uh, in scripture and see what they were looking for versus what the rest of the world was looking for uh, for the Savior. So remember, as we've studied the Gospel Project, um, we looked at the nation of Israel had split uh, into two kingdoms, Israel to the north, Judah to the south, and that this cycle of sin and repentance, sin and repentance eventually led to the fall of both kingdoms. Uh, Israel fell to the Assyrians in 722 BC, and then Judah fell to Babylon beginning uh, there were three waves of deportations beginning in 605, and then finally Jerusalem falls in 586 to Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, so then after that, remember, we talked about the rise of Persia under Cyrus the Great, and uh, under uh, his kingdom, under his rule, and then some of the other Persian kings that followed, like uh, Xerxes and Artaxerxes, uh, the people of Judah were allowed to return to Jerusalem, and they eventually rebuilt the temple after it had been destroyed by the Babylonians. And that was completed in 516. So after that, then, there's that period of 400 years of silence. And it doesn't mean that nothing was going on in the world. There was a lot of things that were happening. It just means that there were no prophecies. So remember, we had just studied all of the prophets. We had looked at... Uh, Jeremiah and Daniel and Jonah and, and uh, Habakkuk and all of these other prophets. So during the 400 years, we don't have anything. There's no prophecies that are being given, but a lot of things are happening. So after uh, Persia had risen and the people of Judah returned, eventually uh, Greece gains power. In 332, Alexander the Great begins to sweep through the ancient world and uh, Persia loses its power and the Greeks actually control uh, Judah and Jerusalem uh, for a while. Then eventually the Ptolemies of Egypt and the Seleucids of uh, Syria struggle for control over Israel and the Seleucids eventually consolidate that control in 198 BC. By 142, the people of Judah throw off the, con uh, the control of the Seleucids somewhat with the help of the Romans. And for a period of time, there is um, a priesthood, kind of a priesthood rule throughout, uh, throughout Judah. Then there becomes this dispute with the families in, in Israel and uh, throughout the priesthood. And by, six, uh, by 63 BC, Pompey, a Roman general, stepped in to uh, settle these disputes and that kind of led to Roman control. And so that's important to take a look at because by the time of the birth of Jesus, that is the major power in the world. 
So Rome has a vast empire. Uh, they are ruling with an iron fist, and they <clears throat> have control over all of Israel. And so what the people are looking for at this time is a Savior. They have, they have known that there's going to be a Savior coming, but they're thinking not Savior in terms of forgiveness of their sins and being able to, you know, and, and having eternal life with God, but they're thinking throwing off all this foreign rule. You know, think for the last five, six hundred years, some foreign ruler has always controlled uh, Jerusalem. And so they want to have independence again. They want a united kingdom and they want um, their independence. So they are looking for God to come in power and glory and for this Savior to come riding in, you know, with a vast army to destroy Rome and, all the, and throw off this foreign rule and set up essentially a kingdom for God uh, in Israel. So that's kind of what they're looking for. But <clears throat> what really is happening here, and we talked about the birth of uh, John the Baptist a couple of weeks ago, and then we looked at the birth of Jesus. And so the first coming of Christ is not with this, this grandeur and power and glory and everything that the people are looking for. He's born in a manger. He's born of very humble beginnings. And so a lot of people are kind of missing what's actually happening there. But as we look at uh, Simeon and Anna today, uh, then we're going to see that uh, they are looking in the right place. So today we're going to talk about the dedication of Jesus then when he was eight days old. And uh, so this is where um, there's the custom of circumcision. And at that time is when you typically the, uh, the son would be named. And so he's named Jesus, uh, literally meaning God saves or Yahweh saves. And then dedication of the first son. What was that? You know, why do we have the dedication? And that is um, coming from the law of Moses. And if you remember back when we talked about with our maps here, when Israel was in Egypt, um, and they were in uh, 430 years of slavery. Remember how that ended with the plagues. So Pharaoh would not let the Israelites go. And so plague after plague comes, and, the, and Pharaoh says, all right, I'll let them go, but only I'll only let the males go. And then, well, no, okay, I'll let everybody go. But you can't take your, can't take your animals for sacrifice. And so it continued on and on like that until eventually you got to the 10th plague. And the 10th plague, remember, was the firstborn in every family would die. Uh, none of the Jews died because of uh, God told them to take the sacrifice of a lamb and to put the blood over the door lentils. And so the, essentially the angel of death would pass over those houses and they would be saved. But a firstborn of everybody else in Egypt, there would not be a household without somebody dead in it. And so after that happened, God told the, the Israelites that you will dedicate your firstborn. So uh, there will always be a sacrifice that will be made when there's uh, a firstborn and that they would be dedicated to the Lord. And so that's where we're at here with, as we open our story today is that Mary and Joseph travel from Bethlehem to Jerusalem. It's a trip of about six miles which to us doesn't sound like a big deal. Well, six miles, get in the car and go. For them, six miles on foot or you know, riding on a donkey with a newborn baby, these aren't you know, paved roads. These are dirty, dusty, dangerous roads that they travel uh, to Jerusalem for the dedication. Uh, and so uh, they're gonna name him, they dedicate him, and it's going to be during this time that two people, uh, Simeon, who has been waiting to see the Christ. He has been told by God that he will not perish, he will not die until he, he actually sets his eyes on the Christ. And so, and he recognizes when they bring Jesus that this is the Savior. And then Anna was a prophetess. Uh, we're gonna see, uh, there, the Bible doesn't talk a lot about these people, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute here. But she was a prophetess. There's four uh, prophetesses that are named throughout scripture. Uh, if you remember, Miriam, which was the sister of Moses, was one. And then Huldah, we talked about Huldah back in, uh, if you remember, when Josiah was king in Judah, and they, uh, he nearly reunited the kingdom until he was killed in 609. Uh, remember when they, they were rededicating the temple at that time, and they found 
the book of the law. And they took it to Hulda and said, what is this? And so she told them, this is the word of God. And then they had it read. So she was a prophetess. And then uh, we have uh, Anna is uh, the third one. And then there is another one called Noadiah. She's actually a false prophetess uh, that is in a list that uh, was named by uh, Nehemiah. So we haven't been study her and we're not going to go into that, but there are four that are named throughout Scripture. Um, so the, the important thing with uh, these two, with Simeon and Anna, is that they recognize Jesus for who he is, though very few others do. Everybody else is looking for the glorious coming uh, of a Savior to defeat Rome, but what they really need is a Savior for the, the uh, forgiveness of sins and the salvation of their souls. So taking a look at our study today, uh, for those who have a book, this is Unit 19, Session 4, Jesus is Dedicated. And so, where I had mentioned that uh, the Bible doesn't talk a lot about, there's not a lot of detail about who Simeon was and who Anna was, um, God's Word <coughs> is not exhaustive in detail. That is, it doesn't tell us everything that we might be curious about, but we must understand that God's Word is sufficient for telling us all we need to know for a life of faith and obedience. What God has revealed in his word is more than sufficient to lead us to salvation, and it is more than sufficient to share with others. Throughout Christian history, there may have been attempts to speculate on the life of, the, of young Jesus. And so I'll just kind of stop there for a minute. There's a lot of times we'll get hung up on, you know, all of these details and talk about things that, you know, or speculate on things. And then sometimes if we you start speculating and you tell one person and they tell somebody else, and before you know it, it's almost like a rumor, you know, spreading rumors to become false. And so there's just really not any value in speculating on things that are just these details that, you know, we really don't need to know. Remember, every word that is in Scripture is God-inspired, that God wrote this. And so even though the, the people actually put pen to paper, it is inspired by God. And so every word that's here is 100% complete. There is not one word missing, and there's not one word extra. And so we don't need to get into all, of, if it's not in here, then we don't need to get into all of the details and speculation. So we don't have all those details of, the, of uh, Jesus's early life in the gospel accounts, but Luke tells us everything we need to know concerning his first years on earth. These concise stories are full of treasures to be mined by careful observation and Luke's description of these events, including the specific words he uses, helps us to know that our redemption comes with a commission to proclaim the salvation that has come. And so that's the other important thing about this, where it talks about mining these words. That's, that's to read carefully. Uh, too many times I think we can kind of go through Scripture and just blow past something, and you have to take time as you're reading it to reflect on what that means. And so I've talked about that a number of times, but having a Bible commentary uh, like John MacArthur or uh, Matthew Henry or something like that can help you to go in and read that, that piece of Scripture and then really understand what does it mean. And so, and, and another good technique for it is to read the scripture, that, the verse that comes before a uh, particular passage that maybe you, you question or don't understand, and read the verse that comes after it. So oftentimes what comes before and after will really help you understand a particular verse if you're struggling with it. So in this session, we're going to take a look at two seasoned saints, Simeon and Anna, encountering the long-awaited Savior of the world. These two saints' responses to beholding Jesus provide us with an example of the evangelistic joy that comes from an encounter with Christ. Because we have redemption through Christ Jesus, we share the good news of Jesus joyfully with others, even while we recognize that some will reject him. So some are going to reject him uh, because they don't understand it. Some are going to reject it, they just miss it. You know, again, these people were looking for something else. Uh, some are going to reject it because they don't want to conform to it. You know, I mean, it requires you to examine your life and decide, you know, if you have sin in your life to repent of that sin. And so some people don't want to do that, so they'll, they'll reject Jesus. So taking a look at our first scripture, this comes out of uh, Luke tw uh, 2, 21 through 24. When the eight days were completed for a circumcision, he was named Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived. Remember who that angel was? We talked about this. So that was Gabriel. So there's two named angels 
in Scripture. We've talked there's been Michael and then Gabriel. And when the days of their purification, according to the law of Moses, were finished, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, just as it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male will be dedicated to the Lord. That's what we talked about way back with the tenth plague when they were in Egypt. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. So Luke mentions Jesus' circumcision and naming in this passage to highlight Joseph's and Mary's obedience to the word, to God's word. So they could have said, no, uh, Jerusalem's too far. That's a six-mile journey. And, uh, you know, they weren't uh, people of means. They weren't wealthy or anything. Um, so, no, we're not going to go. You know, we're going to do this our way. But they uh, acted in obedience. Their obedience to the commands of God sets the stage for the perfect obedience that their firstborn son, Jesus, demonstrates in his life. In these details, Luke not only reveals that Jesus has come to identify with God's people, but also that God has identified him as the Savior of the world, because Jesus means Yahweh saves. So in the Old Testament, it was customary for infant, infant males among God's people to be circumcised on the eighth day. This followed the pattern set in Genesis 17:12, when God commanded Abraham and his descendants to perform this religious rite for all Israelite boys. Luke seems to note this in passing, but it is important because it tells, tells us, the reader, that Jesus was born under the law and therefore identifies with God's people. Luke also then recalls that a messenger of God gave to Joseph and Mary the name Jesus for their child. Remember, uh, even before that with John the Baptist, they get, the angel came and uh, told Zacharias that, the that his name will be John. And remember, um, when they were at that um, dedication and Zacharias could not yet speak. Remember, and the reason for that was he had asked the angel for a sign and uh, that sign was not going to talk until uh, the child is born and dedicated. And so everybody wanted to name him after his father and he had to write, no, his name will be John. And it was at that time that he could speak. So the angels had actually given the names for John and Jesus. So Jesus, again, means Yahweh saves. Matthew 121 clearly states that the significance of his name, he will save his people from their sins. Joseph and Mary demonstrated their obedience to God by naming the baby Jesus, just as the angel had commanded Mary before the baby was conceived and commanded Joseph before he was born. And in keeping with the meaning of his name, as Jesus grew, he demonstrated his obedience to the Father's mission to seek and save the lost. So Luke recorded the events in this passage to show that Jesus is tied into an entire history of the people of Israel. In short, Jesus begins his life as the ideal Israelite, circumcised on the eighth day by humble, obedient parents, and then consecrated to the Lord according to the law of Moses. It is clear that Jesus belonged to God from the very beginning of his life and the rest of Luke's, Luke's gospel. Indeed, all the Gospels communicate in full reality of this belonging as Jesus fulfills his identity and mission. And so he belongs to God, and don't forget, he is God. So that's important as well, just to remember that identity. So Jesus was presented and consecrated to the Lord to show his solidarity with Abraham's children. So the Son of God became a son of Abraham through his birth to Mary and Joseph. Thus, he is one of the stars of the sky. What, is, you know, what does that mean, stars of the sky? Remember when God told Abraham, uh, Abraham's asking for a child. He says, who's going to be the heir of my household? All I have is this servant, Eleazar. And God tells him, no, you indeed will have a son that will be born. And in fact, your offspring will be as numerous as the stars of the sky, if you could number them. So Jesus is one of those. And the sand on the seashore that was promised to Abraham However, we know from the uh, entirety of the New Testament witnesses witness that Jesus wasn't just a child of Abraham. He is the promised seed of Abraham to bring blessing to the entire world. So then Jesus was also consecrated to the Lord following the law of Moses, demonstrating that he was born under the law. His dedication was tied to the Mosaic Law's instruction concerning the firstborn at the time of the 10th plague in, uh, in the Exodus. We talked about that. This dedication was meant to highlight that Mary and Joseph's firstborn son belonged to God. 
Jesus was born under the law with a purpose to fulfill the law of Moses on behalf of God's people and all who would come to him in faith because Jesus is the long-awaited Savior of the world. So what do we talk about that time of purification? So that was for Mary and most likely Joseph for the process of childbirth. So this rite of purification after childbirth required offering a lamb and a turtle dove or young pigeon. So the lamb was to be a burnt offering and the turtle dove or pigeon a sin offering. If the family could not afford a lamb, two birds, one for each offering, uh, was permissible. So in Luke's account, the option of offering a lamb is not mentioned in order to emphasize the lowly financial state, essentially, of Jesus' family. And that's important to remember because Jesus came to the humble and lowly. So they didn't have um, the, the money to go buy the lamb to do the sacrifice, so they offered the two birds instead. All right, so now we're going to take a look at Jesus being recognized as the Lord's Messiah, and this is in Luke 2, 25, 32. So there was a young man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to Israel's consolation, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he saw the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, he entered the temple. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to perform for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him up in his arms, praised God, and said, Now, Master, you can dismiss your servant in peace as you promised, for my eyes have seen your salvation. You have prepared it in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and glory to your people Israel. So by the sovereign province under God, of God, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, Simeon was led into the temple where he would meet Jesus. Simeon had waited his whole life for this moment, and up until this point he was restless, yearning for the comfort and salvation of his people. And then at last the Christ child was before him. In this one breathtaking moment, all of his longings were fulfilled, and he held the life of the world in his arms. Can you imagine that? You've been told, you, it's been revealed to you by God, you know, by the Holy Spirit, that you're going to meet the Savior someday. You know this is coming. You're not going to die until you actually behold the Savior. What, what sense of anticipation Simeon must have had, what sense of just excitement that any day that he gets up, this today could be the day. You know, today's the day that the Savior is going to come into my presence and I'm going to actually see him. So that must have been an incredible thing. And day after day after day, though, you know, it's not happening. And so he's got to wonder, you know, when God, when is this going to occur? And then finally it does. So we don't know much about Simeon except that he was a righteous and devout man and that he was waiting for the long awaited Messiah of Israel and the redemption of God's people. Luke noted that the Holy Spirit was on Simeon, the same spirit who also revealed the promise that he would not see death until he saw the Messiah. So one of our questions here is, how are you encouraged to know that God orchestrates events and chance meetings like this? And chance being kind of in quotations. So was this really a chance meeting? You know, I mean, there, I think there are times when um, it's not just, you know, circumstance. It's not just a coincidence. You know, very clearly, I think this moment where um, Simeon is in the temple and Mary and Joseph bring Jesus in, this is orchestrated by God. This is not just a, a chance encounter. This was an appointment of destiny where this was going, this had been planned. We've talked about this before. If you could, if you could actually measure time in eternity past, a trillion years ago, God knew that at that very moment, Simeon would be in the temple and Jesus would be coming in to his presence. So this was not just an accident. This was a planned event. So God can work through people and can encourage them, can affirm uh, faith. He can work through you to help a struggling brother or sister in Christ. He can direct you to those who need to hear the gospel. You never know when you're going to meet somebody. Um, you know, maybe a new neighbor uh, moves in or something, and maybe they've got, uh, 
you know, a, a young child and, and you become friends with that neighbor and you witness to them and they become uh, followers of Christ and then their child is raised in a Christian home and that child goes on to be a great evangelist someday, you know, or maybe years down the road that child witnesses to somebody. I mean, somebody witnessed to Billy Graham, for instance, for the first time and had no idea at that moment the absolute impact that that was going to have. So, and those are not just chance, you know, accidental encounters. I think those are divine appointments. Um, all right. So Simeon's announcement about the Lord Messiah was good news for all people, both Jew and Gentile. Jesus is the fulfillment of the deepest longings of all people. So these people were looking for, uh, the people of Judah are looking for a savior to come and throw off Roman rule, but what they really needed was salvation. They really needed forgiveness of their sins. They really needed um, the right way to live and, and to be able to live righteously and to follow Christ and to have eternal life. That was their real need. They don't understand that. They don't recognize that. Um, but that's really what they needed to look for. So Jesus is a light to the dark world of the Gentiles and also the glory of God manifested as the promised hope among the Israelites. In this moment of praise, Simeon proclaimed the coming universal dimension of Jesus' redemptive work. Salvation has come to all peoples and nations in Jesus Christ. So Jesus' circumcision, consecration, and the context in which Simeon met him come together to indicate that this child will one day be known as the seed of Abraham, the fulfillment of the law of Moses and the future Davidic king, the Messiah, who will rule on the throne forever. Simeon had received the fulfillment of his promise and the fulfillment of all God's promises as he held the promised one in his arms. So if you had the book, we have the fill in the blank uh, part here. This is on page 37 of your workbook. And this says, God is faithful. God's faithfulness means that he keeps his word and always fulfills his promises. God's faithfulness is demonstrated in his fulfillment of, his prom of the promises he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We reflect God by keeping the promises we make to him and to others. So, the, you know, these are the promises that we've been studying since back at the beginning when we were looking at the beginning of the Old Testament. And this has been over the course of hundreds and hundreds of years. And so people, you know, may be weary and thinking, when, God, when is this, you know, when are you you're going to deliver us? But he keeps his promises. Um, and so, you know, we see that with the birth of Christ. All right, so now we're going to take a look at Jesus is exalted is the one to bring redemption. And this is Luke 2, 33 through 38. So his father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and told his mother Mary, Indeed, this child is destined to cause the fall and rise of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed, and a sword will pierce your own soul, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. When he talks about that, a sword will pierce your own soul. He's, he's actually speaking personally to Mary about the crucifixion, um, that she is actually going to see Jesus crucified, and that is the sword piercing her soul. Uh, so then there was also a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was well along in years, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, and was a widow for 84 years. She did not leave the temple, serving God day and night with fasting and prayers. At that very moment, she came up and began to thank God and to speak about him to all who are looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. So Luke shared the, God, shared the response of Joseph and Mary to Simeon's grand prophetic declaration. They're amazed. You know, can you imagine, you know, you, you have, um, it's just like uh, a, I think when you go into like a parent-teacher conference, you know, and the teacher says, uh, you know, you've got the smartest kid in class and things are great and, and so you're, you're proud, you know, you maybe you're amazed that, wow, this is really something to hear these things. They're even more than that. They're, they're hearing these, these just incredible declarations from Simeon and thinking, how can this be? So, but it's also not the first time necessarily that they've heard this. I mean, they've actually had angels appear to them and tell them things as well. So um, so they've had some uh, knowledge of what's gonna happen as well. So Jesus' parents were amazed and marveled as revelations concerning their beloved son 
born to save the world, continued to unfold. But Simeon also had solemn news to pass on. The life of their newborn son would be difficult, and Mary in particular would bear that grief in her own heart. So we've got a little saying down here by C.S. Lewis. If you've never read C.S. Lewis, uh, I would highly recommend that. Uh, so he's got some just great writings, an excellent book uh, that I would recommend. It's called Mere Christianity. Um, I would get that, and uh, you know, particularly at this time, well, you know, where you know, people are uh, having to stay at home, that's a good book to just try to, to whether you can get it on uh, like an e-reader or something, or uh, try to be able to get that, um, borrow it. That's a good one. But he says, we may note in passing that Jesus was never regarded as a mere mortal teacher. He did not produce that effect on any of the people who actually met him. He produced mainly three effects, hatred, terror, adoration. There was no trace of people expressing mild approval. So what he's saying is nobody came along and said, well, you know, Jesus was a pretty good guy. You know, he had some interesting teachings and, you know, I learned something from him and, you know, he's, he's all right. It was one or the other. People were either absolutely despising him, so the Pharisees wanted to kill him, wanted to get rid of him, and people that wanted to continue to live in their sin did not want to be exposed by him. You know, he made them uncomfortable, you know, where they've got to make a choice now um, to either stop what they're doing and repent or continue and live in their guilt. And they don't like that. And so there was either absolute rejection of him or absolute adoration of him in realizing he's God, that he is, he is going to forgive their sins and that they have um, eternal life with him and that he is Savior. So there was no middle ground with Jesus. And there's still not today. You can't, you know, you have to make a decision at some point in your life, you know, what are you going to do with him? You can't be like, well, you know, well, well you know, he's okay and uh, he's a good teacher or something. It's, it's, a, it's an all or nothing thing. You either have Jesus and have him in your life and you are a Christ follower or you don't. There's no middle ground with it and you have to make that decision. So Simeon blessed the new parents, but then he turned to Mary to warn her of what was to come. He declared that her baby would be the cause of people either rising or falling in Israel. Jesus, the son of God, had come to live the humble or to lift the humble and bring down the self-righteous. He is the one to bring the salvation of God into the world. He came to redeem sinners. Though Simeon accepted Jesus in his arms with joy, many in Israel would oppose him. This would lead ultimately to his rejection and crucifixion, yet also to our redemption and salvation. So this prophetic declaration to Mary would prepare her to watch the oft times difficult events play out in the life of her beloved child, as she would ultimately see her son rejected by his own people and crucified. Watching Jesus' life unfold would cause Mary great pain because Jesus exposes the hearts of human beings concerning their unbelief in God and his actions, and many would respond harshly to such revelations. But Jesus is the Son of God, the image of the invisible God and our Savior. He has become the litmus test as to where an individual stands before God. So again, stand, you know, all people that have ever lived are going to stand before God one day and are going to be judged in that test um, for where you end up spending eternity is going to be based on that relationship and faith in Jesus Christ. So Jesus either provokes a response of amazement or rejection. There is no between. You either come to him in faith or you're walking away from him in unbelief. The former results in a gift of eternal life. The later um, earns eternal death. And so we, another one of our questions here is why is the call to follow Jesus in faith so divisive? You know, why do people uh, reject him? When you talk about, you know, look, you can have eternal life. You have, you'd be forgiven of everything you've ever done. And we talk about that it's not just a forgiveness like we think about it. If I bump into somebody on the street and I say, oh, I'm sorry, and they say, well, I forgive you. I've bumped into them. I still have done that. Um, but this is a transformation in this that I take on Christ's righteous life. You know, he lived a righteous life. I can't live a righteous life. That means zero sin in Jesus's entire life. And that comes, gets credited to my account. Yet he lived without sin and I've lived a sinful life. All of my sin then transfers over on to him. 
So there's that exchange. So it's a deeper form of forgiveness than what people just, you know, you know, hey, I'm sorry, I uh, forgive you. In this case, um, it is a transformation. But why do people reject that? You know, some things, um, you know, requires the admission that we're sinners. Some people don't want to admit that. They don't want to say, well, you know, yeah, I, I have sinned. And even, even if you've only sinned one time, you know, even if it was just a, the smallest of, of a lie, that's a sin. And in the presence of a holy God, and remember, you know, God's holy. No one holy thing can come into his presence. So even a person that sinned only the smallest sin, if you can, can equate something, if you can measure sin at all, uh, still means you can't come into a holy God's presence. And so if you do not have the forgiveness of Christ, you cannot have eternal life. Um, so sometimes faith requires repentance from a sin that we've previously enjoyed to some degree. Sometimes you don't want to give up that sin. Uh, it's, it's a sin habit or something you want to continue to do. Um, the call to follow Christ is a call to die to ourselves and live exclusively for him. And that, that can be a difficult thing to do. Um, you cannot, um, no works are going to get uh, salvation. You can't say, well, I've, you know, I've donated thousands of dollars to charity and I've done thousands of hours of volunteer work and all of these good things cannot earn our way to heaven. No matter, without Christ, even if you've done all these wonderful, wonderful things, you, you still don't have salvation. And being a good person isn't enough. You can be the best person. You can be, you know, Mr. Rogers, for instance, and just be a very gentle soul, very kind, loving person. But without Jesus, without that salvation, without that forgiveness of sin, you don't have eternal life. And so the only way to have eternal life is to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, having faith in Jesus, and to repent of sin, and to live a, a godly, Christ-centered life. So in addition to Simeon's witness and prophetic words about the baby Jesus, Luke introduces a second witness, a prophetess named Anna. Well advanced in age and widowed for years, this seasoned saint demonstrated exemplary piety in the temple and before the Lord. Her example in this encounter is both, both informative and instructive for our worship and our witness to Jesus Christ. So it's informative because Anna thanked God for sending Jesus, the Redeemer of Jerusalem. Our worship of the Father must be based on gratitude to him for what he has done for us in Jesus. Anna helped others see that their hope for redemption of Jerusalem was to be found in this baby boy. Our witness to the world must also be based on the coming of Jesus into the world to save sinners. So it's also instructive in that Anna spent so much of her life in the temple fasting, praying, and serving the Lord, but she still thanked and worshiped the Lord because he sent Jesus. Her devotion and good works were not an end in and of themselves. Remember I said good works aren't going to do it. The fact that she was a good person, the fact that she had good works would not have saved her. If Anna had not uh, accepted Christ as Savior, even this prophetess, this woman of many, many years of service in the temple, would not have been saved. But an overflow of her heart and a life focused on the gracious and loving God of Israel. Worship is the first and foremost something of a heart that extends to all areas of life. The aim and focus of worship is God, giving him the exact due of praise and adoration that he deserves. Anna's gratitude to the Father for sending the Son caused her to tell others about Jesus. People were hoping and searching for the promised redemption of Jerusalem, and Anna, through her witness, had just what they were looking for. All right, so just to kind of close it up here with this uh, last paragraph, and then next week uh, we start looking at Jesus in the temple. Um, and then uh, so we'll close this, have a couple last things to say, we'll pray, and then that'll be it. So both si uh, Simeon and Anna praised God when they saw the baby Jesus, recognizing him as the promised light to the Gentiles and the glory of Israel. Yet Simeon also prophesied that many would oppose him. Jesus came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him by faith, he gave them the right to be children of God. We must remember now, those who have been saved by Christ are sent to share Christ with others. Once we've discovered Christ as our long-awaited for uh, salvation, how could we not tell others about the redemption to be found in him? 
So if you have any questions, you can um, you can uh, send them through the chat uh, on Facebook. Um, you can always contact me personally. You can contact the church if you have questions uh, about receiving Jesus uh, as your Lord and Savior. You know, please contact me or the church, and someone will be happy to pray with you. Uh, remember in these difficult times uh, to take care of each other, to pray for each other. Um, remember that God is in control. There's nothing that surprises him, so there's nothing that is out of his control. There's nothing that he hasn't seen uh, coming. And so we can just have faith and trust and confidence uh, in walking with him day by day. So let's close in prayer, and then we'll go to worship. Dear Father, we just thank you for this day and this time that we could just learn from your word. And we just pray, Father, that you would just uh, comfort us. We pray that you would forgive us of our sins. We pray that you would just help us to be witnesses for others, give us opportunities to meet others and just share the gospel message with them. Just help us to remember that you are in control of everything um, and uh, just uh, keep everyone safe. And we pray these things with love in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm. All right, I'll see you next week. Yeah.